researcher and program developer uh, based at the Education Development Center in New York. And I've been working with ROE 47 for the last two years. And it's been uh, wonderful <laughs> working in uh, Western Illinois, Northwestern Illinois. We've really enjoyed, um, we've enjoyed Sterling and all, all it has to offer. <laughs> Uh, Nesta, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Nesta Marshall. I've been with Math for All for seven years now, um, serving in the capacity as a coach as well as a facilitator. Karen? And I am Karen Rothschild. I also work for Math for All. I also teach at Bank Street College, as does Nesta. Um, <laughs> Um, in the math leadership program there. Nesta works in special ed and um, we work together uh, just like we like to work together with special ed and content people um, at Math for All. Great, so let me uh, uh, share my screen. Okay, so um, uh, we were tasked to talk about equity and access for students with disabilities, and that, that is our, the focus of uh, a lot of our work. So that was a perfect topic for, for us to share with you and to speak with you about. Uh, so we did our introductions. Um, so here's a quick overview over um, our uh, agenda. Uh, we want to start with uh, just a quick um, introductions. We'd like to um, get to know you, <laughs> to know uh, who you are, um, and what your roles are in, in what, what school you're working with. Um, then we will talk a little bit about what we mean by equity. And Krista was just telling us that the uh, picture that we had on our title slide, um, that you're well familiar with that <laughs> from, from the previous sessions, which is great. It's nice that there's a, without even speaking of you know, planning much, but um, so it's, it sounds like we're all on the same page. Um, anyway, um, after talking a little bit about what we mean by equity, we uh, will, um, we will sh uh, go through a, a hands-on activity, um, sort of um, show you by example, um, how to go about making high quality uh, instruction accessible to all students, including students with disabilities. And then um, we will uh, men mention uh, to you an opportunity for, um, for participating in a grant supported professional learning program. We um, have done some work already with schools in ROE 47 and we have um, two more years of, of funding and we're hoping to continue our wonderful work in, in your area and hope to find more schools that are interested in working with us. Um, so if you could just briefly introduce yourself in the chat box, uh, we would love to know uh, your name, your school or district that you're working in and your role, whether, you're not, whether or not you're a general educator or special educator or administrator, uh, and then also the grade level or levels that you're working with. Some of you I do recognize. I know that you're working with our researcher, Teresa, Gail, and Marsha. And we've, we've uh, briefly met before, I think last year at one of the schools. So it's great to see you both. So we have Diane, who's an ROE 47 coach. And Deanna is the principal at at Monroe Center Grade School. Nice, Stacy Dingus works for ROE 47. And I think we know you're, we've, we've uh, been working with uh, Shauna Dingus, <laughs> so, um, who I believe is a family member. And let's see who we have. We have Kelly, who, who's a teacher at Rock Falls High School, English Language Arts, okay. We have Angie Buscol, 
Stewart Elementary School. Special education teacher. All right, great. I hope I didn't miss anybody. I don't see the full screen on the, for the chat box. But it's wonderful to have you here. And um, so let's jump right in. I'm going to turn it over to Nesta, who will um, start us off. Thanks, Babette. Next slide, please. Second. So who are students with uh, disabilities? According to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, otherwise known as IDEA Act, IDEA rather, uh, disability is defined as a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. Improving educational results for children with disabilities is an essential element of our natural policy of ensuring equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency for individuals with disabilities. You want me to go to the next I'm slide? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me one second here. So how many students with disabilities are there? Uh, in 2018 to 2019, uh, it was found that there are about 14% of all public school students aged 3 to 21 years old uh, receive special education services. Now, when we take a look at the ROE 47 school districts, 15% of students uh, had IEPs, and that was the data gathered in 2018, with some schools having a percentage as small as 7% and others 19% of their student body. Next slide. So let's take a zoom in look at uh, the different types of disabilities. And topping the list is uh, specific learning disabilities. And following learning disabilities, I believe we have their speech or language impairment and other health impairment, which includes students with diabetes, asthma, uh, students with epilepsy. And um, you will also notice on our graph that there are other disability types uh, listed, though they occur with uh, lesser frequency. However, they're still worth uh, noting. Next slide. Where are students with disabilities served? 95% of students aged six to 21 years old are served in non-specialized uh, settings or schools where uh, staff are not specifically trained to support students with the particular disability type. And then a little over 60% of students in the same age band uh, spend most of their school day, a great part, about 80%, or more in general education classrooms. And of course the disability type will vary from one classroom to another, but I think you'll concur with me that that is quite a high number, right? Of students who are in gen ed classrooms and who uh, uh, present or are labeled as having a disability. Next slide, please. So take a moment to uh, take in uh, this cartoon. Can it be enlarged a little bit more, please? Sure. Um, let's see. 
get rid of this. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I need to turn off the, the um, special <laughs> frame. Well, <laughs> All right, here we go. Is this better? Do you see it big? I can. Can the rest of our audience, our teachers? Yes, good. Thanks for the thumbs up. All right, we don't have time to really chat about this, but I'm hoping that the message that looms large for you as you viewed uh, this visual uh, depiction is that how differently students with disabilities will be viewed if only their classrooms had supports that align with the way their kind of mind works best. So with that in mind, uh, it brings us to our next slide. We'll be talking about what do we mean by equity? And here is your chance to tell us a little bit about what's going on in your mind. When, next slide please, when you think of equity in the classroom. So in a moment, we're going to ask you to write some characteristics of an equitable classroom. And if you can just list one or two ideas that come to mind for you in the chat box when you hear the term equitable classroom. So we're seeing some comments uh, coming in. Uh, the whole idea of all students or inclusion, uh, meeting students where they're at, uh, seeing them bringing assets and providing uh, supports to strengthen those areas that are uh, in need of being buttressed, um, making provision for what they need. We're seeing a lot of thinking of students' needs and meeting those needs uh, via uh, supports that would uh, ensure success, maximizing their learning environment and growth and thinking of the student holistically. All right. Uh, so I, I think uh, it is fair for us to say that even though an, an equitable classroom to us may have varied and distinctive uh, uh, features uh, based on who the educator is <laughs> uh, in that particular room, there's going to be one fundamental hallmark of an equitable classroom, and that is setting up students for success regardless of their ethnicity, their socioeconomic status, and regardless of the different abilities <laughs> which they uh, bring to us when they walk into our front there learning milieu. And to add to that, uh, thank you for the comment about providing a variety of 
resources and a teaching style so that uh, it's not only about uh, the learner, <laughs> but it's also about the educator or the teacher making the uh, necessary uh, modifications uh, to ensure that uh, learning is taking place optimally and uh, we're setting up students for success. Next. So the Illinois State Board of Education um, helps us out a big bit <laughs> by uh, capturing uh, what they uh, deem to be equitable education. And Krista, I'm gonna put you on the spot because I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking. Can you, can you read that uh, quote for us, please? Absolutely. All students need safe and inclusive schools and challenging and individualized curriculum and instruction. Even so, each student comes to the classroom with different strengths. Equity requires that each child receives the attention, resources, access, and support he or she needs to become socially and emotionally secure adults. Next slide. So if we were to distill uh, equitable instruction into like four pithy elements of equitable instruction, uh, we would say that it uh, is characterized by rigorous, learning standards, inclusive classrooms to focus on all ALL -L and capital letters, all students, high expectations for all students, uh, including those with uh, disabilities, and that students receive individualized support based on their strengths and challenges. Next slide. So we, we've had our impressions of what we deem to be equitable um, instruction. Now here's our opportunity to hear from uh, students. And as they uh, tell us uh, their uh, view and perspective, I like all of us to be thinking about how the video and the information being shared by these students, how it's speaking to us. What, what, what is our takeaway from it? Okay, take a listen. This works. <laughs> Dear teacher, I know it doesn't always seem like but I really do want to listen and learn. It's just my brain. It's kind of different. So this is what I'd like you to know about me. I have to move, or I really can't pay attention. Even though I'm not looking at you, I can still listen to what you're saying. If you tell me, sit up straight, now I have to use all of my brain to do just that. It makes me feel sad when you tell me to try harder, even though I've already tried as hard as I can. I actually listen better when I'm rocking in my chair. When you give me a bunch of directions, I start to think I will never remember all of this. Sometimes my mom or dad ends up doing all of my homework. So here's how you could maybe help. Let me get up and move while I'm learning. Let me look wherever I want when you talk to me. Let me rock or slouch in my chair. No matter what, please don't take away my recess. Give me hope I can do all by myself. Great direction, very short. Just ask me, what does your brain need right now? And one more thing, my brain might be different than yours, but it's still amazing. Sincerely, your student. Your student. Your student. Your student. Ah, I watched that video so many times and yet it still resonates so strongly for me. The message is um, palpable. So it's your turn now uh, to say to our community or learning community, 
um, what spoke to you in that um, moment that you just viewed uh, from these students? Just on mute and speak, that will be fine. Don't need to raise your hand. Just, just how it resonates with us when we watch that in general, you mean? Okay. Yeah. Or any, anything that you're taking away from it, yeah. All I just thought of is um, there's a lot of work we've been trying to do and, and do more restorative practices in terms of how we um, work with students when they're struggling with and maybe even behaviors and stuff like that. And when I- Your teacher. Oops. I know it doesn't I'm always sorry. seem like it, but- Sorry. No, don't be sorry. You're just fine. Um, and so like in the chat, I just said amen to that after they said, and please don't take away my recess because- I, I, there's so many things that are misunderstood that I think that children do, or they're trying to communicate to us in a different way. And we're just making these assumptions about what we think we know. And if there's anything the last year has taught me is um, maybe what, maybe what I thought I knew I didn't know. And, and so I'm learning through it, but um, it's just amazing to me to think of um, the changes that have been made and the things that um, are becoming really truly what best practice is that's a, that when I hear best practice you know five six years ago best practice to me now means completely something different and um, best practice means like just a whole little person that you can help be their their great self so it's it's yeah it's that's what resonated with me thank you for that reminder am I saying your name right Deanna it's yeah. actually Dina. I don't correct Dina. it very often. Uh, I know it's a toughie. It's just Dina. Okay. Uh, uh, Dina, because I have to tell you, I felt quite disabled and still do with the technological uh, delivery and receiving of information. So um, there we go, right? Disability. Any others? A couple more? Uh, go ahead, Mrs. B. Yeah. Sorry, that didn't change. I meant to change that to my full name, Angie. Angie, there we go. <laughs> I like where the student said, just ask me what does my that what does your brain need right now? Mm -hmm. that, was, that kind of resounded with me, like, yeah, I could really do that. Mm -hmm. Or I should really do that. So giving them agency ownership, right? And making them a, a co constructor of right. the learning. Right. They're telling you their part. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. Any others? A little boy who said that he, he can't sit still. Mm -hmm. um, in COVID school, you have to sit in your desk and you can't, you're not supposed to be moving around the room. And a lot of students, that's really hard for them. So I have one of those students in my house <laughs> right now. So that, that really spoke to me. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm sure there are other uh, comments, uh, but we have a full, a chock full <laughs> of, of, of information and activities to do with you. Um, but some parting words, uh, students have unique minds. Uh, they learn differently and they benefit from learner specific supports. And with that, Karen is gonna take it away now for us. Yeah, Babette, would you let me share my screen so I can oh, yes. travel? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so, so now that we have talked about who they are and what <clears throat> what they want, um, what what are some things we can can do to to make it um, a little easier for them and for us? Um, so. We like this uh, little balloon diagram that sort of says, it, in order for good learning to happen, teachers need to know the content itself. They really have to understand um, what it is they're teaching in a very deep way. Um, they need to know those students. They need to know who needs to move around, who needs to look away, who needs to put their head on the table, who needs uh, blinders, whatever. Um, and then along with that, we need this huge repertoire of um, teaching strategies that um, will help us tailor our tasks and the things that we're teaching 
to all of those students in a way that makes it look like the ramp in that cartoon. I don't know if you were able to see it, but the, the point was that most of the students could go up the stairs, but everybody could go up the ramp. So why not just have a ramp? If you're having a classroom, why not make your classroom a ramp? Why make it a staircase if you have a way to make it a ramp and then everybody can go up. Um, so we're gonna um, do a, an activity and I'm gonna uh, do a demonstration because I think it might be a little confusing. So if you give me a second, I'm gonna stop sharing this and then share the activity. Um, the activity, you, you will get, um, and it's a, this one says group two, but do you see it? You don't see it. Am I right? You don't see it? Okay, share screen. There. Right, present. Oh, but I can't, I can't play with it when I'm presenting. So I will have to go back to the smaller, the smaller window, if you don't mind. Can you all see that? Is it big enough? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna make rectangles. You've got a lot of tiles here and you have 24, I believe of each color and you can move them, drag them and move them like I am. And you can make rectangles out of them. Like this is a, gonna be, a, oh, I, I move it a little bit closer. And I could fill that in and make it a three by two rectangle and that would be six. But we're going to ask you to make all the different rectangles you can with 24. Uh, Babette, are you doing groups? I have, I, yep, I have groups ready. We have three groups of four. Is that correct? Or four groups okay. of three? So when you get into your group, your task is, and now let me go back to the, um, the other. Can you, can you see that or not exploring the demands of a task? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you'll go to the, the slide deck and the, that uh, link should be in the chat. You'll arrange the 24 tiles into a, as many different rectangles as you can come up with that all have 24 tiles in them and are all rectangles. And then at the bottom, there's a text box where you can record those dimensions. And then there's a little question above that text box that asks you, what all did you have to know and be able to do in order to do this task? And that includes all the things that you had to know math wise and everything else that you had to be able to manage in order to do this task. So when you're ready, first of all, are there questions? Okay, so when you're ready, go in your groups, make a bunch of rectangles, find the dimensions and think about what we call the demands of the task. What all do you have to have abilities? What kind of abilities do you have to have and knowledge and skills, math-wise or anything else in order to do the task? Karen, do you have time that you would like us to spend in their breakout groups? Um, I don't know. How much time did we allot? Five minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, so you'll be back at 4.42. Now, just going, I'm going to give my fellow peers, when you say um, I, other items you need to be able to do on top of mathematical, we're thinking linguistical, social, um, any other things that are happening with you as a learner and working with another um, partners here too. So, um, I know we're probably math minded when we're working on a task like this. So really thinking about all the other um, encounters that students would have to be able to know and do to be successful in this task. So I'm learning from my math for all team. All right, I'm gonna open up the rooms. I have four in each room, except for one room has three, um, but there's a math for all person in each one. So they can help out if they would like. Here oh, we I go. Oh, you're gonna do that then. I didn't have to demonstrate. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's good. And the link is in the chat. All right, here you go. I'll give you 10 minutes.
Okay, so this is still me, right? Um, are you still seeing my screen or do I have to reshare it? Reshare it, please. Okay. Yes, will do. Okay, so um, is somebody scribing? I am. Bet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what did you have to know and be able to do while working on this task? We will scribe for you. Shout out whenever you're ready. We needed to figure out how to move the blocks. And Are you typing, Babette? And to be perfect. Are you not seeing it? No. All right. I'm going to um, go into the escape mode. Oops. This is not happening. I mean, I can type in the chat otherwise. Yeah, why don't you type in the chat? Yeah, I agree. I heard as we went um, by a lot of the social, we talked about um, how important, how difficult it is to work in a group and have those social, but even more so remotely and how it takes more time. What a rectangle is. Mm -hmm. oh, as long as he is. is. And this one, we were talking about how you need to have some knowledge of Google Slides or Google how this works anyway, so. Talked about even the physical demands of holding the mouse and being able to drag. Um, you know, you may have a student in your class who has physical, a physical impairments like that, that you can make accommodations for. And then we talked about too, as a team, if you're talking about like doing it like by colors, there's those that like you might, you need to know colors. And if you don't know the colors or you can't see them, if you're colorblind, you might need to be able to know right, center, left, stuff like that and directional mm -hmm. signals. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody in my group said something about sharing space. On the slide. Okay, Alex, Karen, you don't. Yeah. So, um, where am I on my slides? One moment. I should be there. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Pardon me. Okay. So, this is something we call the neurodevelopmental framework. You can see it. Yes. No, we don't. We don't see a slide. You don't see the slide, so I have to share my slide again. Share screen. Okay. Nope, that's not the slide I want. Um, I want this one. Okay. So we organize our work of thinking about what it is we're asking children to do using what we call the neurodevelopmental framework. And we organize all these things that you mentioned into these eight categories. So you need certain kinds of language skills. Some of them are vocabulary, like you mentioned, knowing what a rectangle is, knowing what um, um, the various other vocabulary words are. And the other is just the ability to communicate, which I'm having trouble doing right now. Um, you know, and paying attention and remembering what is what you're supposed to do and also just remembering the language that so the memory and language often go together knowing what to do first temporal sequencing spatial ordering finding room together neuromotor managing the mouse all that stuff social cognition knowing how to collaborate knowing to share so we call this a neurodevelopmental framework and what we do is we think about every task that we do through these lenses and what we'd like you to do is think about a student you have 
that you worked with in math and think about these eight things and think about a couple of strengths and a couple of challenges that this student might have in these areas. And you can just shout out answers as you think about it. As we said, some kids don't have that motor, uh, the fine motor, being able to move things in a, a small way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, some kids would um, maybe have to do the, uh, like a, an actual manipulative first, like the tactile piece, and then move to the visual representation of the, um, of the tile. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot of new curriculums and very important shifts in math is that we're asking students to explain their work. You know, before we were just wanting the answer, and um, now we're getting really to the meat of the math and asking them to explain how they got their work and encouraging um, different types of um, solutions to solve their problem. Um, so I think that language piece, especially in math, has become more difficult, especially for your students who just could solve it and be done. And so asking them to go back and um, Tell you how they did it has been a, a tricky piece for a lot of kids, but a really important one. Yeah, and for a lot of teachers, I think as well. Yeah. We also ask a lot of not only how, but why, you know, and kids may or may not know why. And even if they do, they may or may not be able to communicate it. They may not be able to say it. They might be able to draw it. They might be able to point something out. So what we try to do um, is make the tasks more accessible without changing the math. So as you said, if that stuff online doesn't work, somehow get something into the child's hands so that they can do the math, that they can make the rectangles. We don't care if they can do it on slides or not. We want to adapt the task so that they have access to the mathematics. If you can't explain yourself, maybe you can act it out. Maybe you can show me. Maybe you can. Um, maybe you can draw me a picture. There, are, there are other ways of demonstrating. Amanda, please call extension two three nine. Amanda, please call two three nine. All right. So um, that's kind of basically what Math for All is about. It's thinking about the mathematics. And thinking about who our students are and how we can adapt lessons to make them a ramp so that everybody can get on. If everybody has physical tiles, then everybody can use physical tiles. And if you want to use the ones online, you can use the ones online. And that's why we call it math for all, because we keep the math and change the presentation. This, I mean, this is an example from Math for All, but it's really, it, you know, you could do it in any kind of content area. I mean, in order to make instruction accessible, um, you, need, you need to understand what the demands of, of the task are that you're asking the, ch the child or the student to work on. And you need to know what the student's learning profile is, um, the strengths and challenges. Um, to, to anticipate what kinds of um, is access issues they may run into and then figure out how you can help the child overcome those um, access challenges. So while this example is from math, it, it really applies across content areas. I, I think there'd be real I value wanna... too in the idea of having the students do exactly what you had us do like as they complete that task, then they share out what did they need to be able to do? What problems did they encounter and how did they solve them as a team? To me, if you just applied that across content and across activities, it would really be empowering for kids because it would provide them with alternative ways they could make that task um, easier and more accessible for everybody in the team on the team. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks. 
<laughs> I just need to bring Dina along to be the typist and we would be fine. <laughs> Um, we have five minutes left, so I want to ask quickly if there are any questions and then let Babette um, tell you about more about what we do. Are there any questions? Okay, Babette, you want me to continue to share or do you want to okay, share? Great. Um, so as I mentioned, I just want to quickly mention to you, so we currently have funding from the U.S. Department of Education to um, to offer professional development for um, you know, our program, Math for All, um, which focuses on teachers in grades K through five um, and uh, has the goal of helping teachers make standards-based um, mathematics instruction accessible to all students. And so we have the opportunity to offer this um, to schools across Illinois and um, it's part of a research project. So we're also, you know, the, the fact that, you know, we, we can offer this for, for, for free at no cost for, to, to schools um, because um, this is part of a research study. So we're also collecting some data. Um, so essentially, you know, what's important to know about Math Hall is that it's not a curriculum for K-5 students. It's a, it's a pro program, professional development program. And so the work that we're doing is, um, we're working with teachers um, to, to give them, to help them develop a better understanding of individual students' learning profiles, their strengths and challenges, use, drawing on this newer developmental framework, and, um, and also a better understanding of the demands of mathematical tasks. And oops, can you go back? I can, I'm just pushing because we have three minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we're introducing, uh, teach us to a, for, to a process for um, planning ex, uh, accessible math lessons. Um, it's very practice oriented. Um, and so we're, um, and Karen. <laughs> Where do you want me? Go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so we are inviting schools who are interested to let us know that they are, and, and we would love to talk to you and see um, if we can work with you. It's a two-year program, so two-year commitment uh, starting um, this coming school year and going through uh, 2023. And uh, there would be an expectation also to participate in the research, so that's important. We, you know, you know, we can offer this for free, but we do need to collect data, so that's an important requirement. And then next slide. We have a, a, a flyer that describes all of this, and we, we're happy to share that with you. Um, we also have a website that has more information about this. But um, one other aspect uh, of our work that I should mention is that we're we're really trying to build local capacity as well. So as, we're not only uh, working with teachers, but we're also training local um, teacher leaders and staff developers or coaches to um, implement the program so that um, it's not all dependent on us so that the, you know, the, the work can continue once you know, our grant funding is over. So, um, so that's just a little plug. We hope you might we, we spark a little bit of interest. Um, and uh, our next, the next slide shows our contact. Or, well, at the end, there's a contact information. You can email us. And uh, we also have a website and we can make this PowerPoint available um, to you so that you have, so you have all this information. Okay, I just have to put in a huge plug quickly. I've got to work with this group for the last two years and they are probably the most all encompassing and supportive um, PD that we've, um, that, that we get to work with. Um, they not only work through Zoom to be there for the facilitators all the time, but they fly in in non-COVID times um, frequently. They're here to support you as you are um, working with your facilitators and training your staff. And um, it really just enabled me to see teaching in a, in a really more broad way. It really, uh, the idea of instead of teaching to the 80% that we were kind of trained to do, um, thinking about some of those outliers and thinking about how we can make the um, content accessible to some of the students who have other, our disabilities. And then when we provide those structures for them, it benefits all students. So um, I think it's really, it's just, and then you can apply this in all areas of your content in your educational day. So 
Um, we will be having an informational meeting in April um, that will be out in our next uh, March and April schedule. It's coming out, emailing out tomorrow, hopefully. So I want to thank Babette and Nesta and Karen for being here with us today. Any other questions um, by the group before I wrap us up here? All right. Thank you, everyone, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Yes. Yes. So thank you so much to our Math for All team and to um, the rest of you on here. You've been with me, I think, all, most of you for our whole equity series, and I've really enjoyed it. Come back next week and we'll do some yoga and mindfulness. So looking forward to that as well. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.